Uh, Glennis, what, why do we know, for instance, why must we know that there is dark matter in the universe? What is it about what Brian said before, the seen world being, being acted upon by something unseen that forces us to conclude that uh, uh, there is dark matter? Well, by now the evidence is really in many, many different, uh, different types of evidence, but the really very first evidence is maybe an easy way to think about it. And it was in the 30s, 1930s, that Fritz Wicke, a very irascible professor at Caltech. I mean, maybe if he had been a nicer guy, people might have accepted the idea earlier. But he, uh, they had learned to measure the velocities of stars in a re nearby cluster of galaxies. And also, the, now we know there's thousands of stars in that cluster of galaxies. He only had a hand of maybe a foot or 20. And he measured the velocities, and he concluded that they couldn't be moving as fast as they were, given the amount of mass that he could see in the stars. Um, and he estimated that there was a deficit of matter by a, a, a big factor, like a factor of 100, I think he thought. Um, and it's basically the principle you use if you imagine if you were trying to spin a ball like you did as a kid, the harder you pull on it, on the rope, the faster it spins. And so there's a correlation between the strength of the force that's pulling and the speed of the things that are going around. And that was the original uh, evidence. And then uh, the evidence that really convinced people, I mean, it's really has been difficult for theorists to accept any of this stuff as it's come along. And um, because there's very strong evidence that there's not extra regular matter. There's not black hats floating around out there, by the way. Um, but I suspected as much. Okay. Um, in any case, uh, work of Vera Rubin really n nailed it because she did the, she's an a astronomer, and she did the experiment of looking at a bunch of galaxies side on, and if you can imagine, there's a, the, the stars are rotating around the center, and by looking at the velocity of rotation as a function of their distance from the center, uh, you can basically measure how much mass there is that's pulling in, because if they're further away and the, there's just a, from a given amount of mass, then they rotate slower than if they're right in the right close. The solar system behaves that way. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, which yes, means sir. that uh, Mercury's cruising pretty rapidly, uh, Neptune is moving slowly, and it's all a function of distance from the sun. Right. So what she discovered, though, is when you look at a galaxy side on, the velocities don't decrease. And the only explanation for that, but, but the mass does. You can just see that the amount of stars is decreasing. Let me stop you there for a second. So she, in, look, in looking at these bodies that she presumed would behave, as we all would presume, would behave like the solar system, you, you would expect the uh, stars out on the outside to move slower than the stuff in the middle. She discovered that even though as the galaxy got dimmer and less ap apparently dense, the velocities were just the same on the outside as in the center. Yes, and now it's, been, it's gone even further. People can look at stars that are, or, or other tracers that are so far out, they're just, you know, there's no, no galactic disk out there, and they can see that the motions of stars way outside the galactic disk and so on. So there's a whole lot of different pieces of evidence now. And, and, and you said a moment ago that you can see that there's less mass there, but it's still spinning just as quickly. Yes. You, in a sense, you kind of misspoke. The only reason it could be spinning at the same rate is because there is some unseen mass. Well, that's the, that's the, probably all of us would agree with that. But there is a, a lunatic fringe, and I'm just joking. There are, there, are respectable, there are respectable physicists who try to find alternates where they would exp ex describe it as a modification to the laws of gravity that cause that kind of behavior. So in fact, I, I shouldn't joke. Well, way. we call them the birthers. <laughs> <laughs> the birthers, I see, yes. yes. But in any uh, case, but the bottom line is that one interpretation, in some sense, the least destructive of our cherished laws of physics is that there's extra matter. There's nothing that impossible about there being extra matter. Um, it's just we don't know what it is. Well, let's look at some of the um, theoretical representations that you've brought with you that give a sense of how we can actually go about testing and exploring some of these concepts using observable features in the universe and trying to deduce from their behavior exactly where the dark matter might be. You've got a first slide here. Let's put it up. 
is the main mode of inquiry here is to detect the unseen by its effect on the scene. So, uh, uh, Catherine, explain what's going on here in this picture. Well, there's millions of pieces of evidence at this point in favor of the dark matter theory, and this is another one. So we talked about the speeding up of stars at far distances from the centers of galaxies or, and so forth. But this is another mechanism. So the, the way this works, it's called lensing. So um, Einstein's theory of general relativity tells you that whenever there's a mass, it bends light. And this was first tested by observing um, some light passing the sun. So the mass of the sun is, is heavy enough to actually bend light. So it distorted the light coming around the sun during a measure during a solar eclipse, I believe. Right. Yeah. And there was also the measurement of distortions in the apparent orbit of Mercury at a certain particular time, which confirmed this theory that gravity bends light under certain circumstances. So um, this has actually become a, a major tool for finding dark matter in the universe, because you look at some distant bright object, a distant quasar in this case, and then you observe um, what the mass in front of it does to the image that you're looking at. So some of the things that could happen is that the, you can see multiple images of the same thing, because the light is coming around one side or it's coming around the other. That's why you call it lensing. It, it essentially it's, creates a distortion pattern that's measurable. Yes, definitely. Um, and in fact, in the perfect case, you see it coming around on all sides, and that's called an Einstein ring. And it was Jackie Hewitt at MIT who first found that, so that was, that's pretty cool. So what you, see, what you see here is a computer reconstruction of the mass that it took to bend the background light. And so what you see are, this is a very rich cluster, and rich is defined by having tons of galaxies in it, and that's what those spikes are. So and the spikes are the out. actual observable galaxies. Those we know, those are galaxies we know right. about. And so it's not surprising they would have mass in them. But look, in between, you still have this sort of uh, giant smooth component, and that's some kind of mass. It's, it's got to be dark matter. So the individual galaxies have dark matter in them, but even in between the galaxies, these clusters also have additional components. So there's just an awful lot of mass out there.